Hello and welcome to Living a Culture of Life podcast by Human Life International. I'm your host, Colleen Haupt, and I'm joined today by Michael New, who's joining us from CUA. Welcome. Ah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming out today. And we're going to be talking today about basically one year post Dobbs, where we're at in the country, what's been going on, how Dobbs affected abortion trends and legislation, and what we can do moving forward. So, welcome. When did you, um, like, when did you first get involved in studying abortion trends and data and all of that? Yeah, it's interesting. I was always involved in the pro life movement. Uh, you know, I was an undergrad at Dartmouth. I was a graduate student at Stanford. I was involved with pro life groups. It's both an undergrad and as a grad student, but it never really dawned on me to kind of integrate my interest in sanctity of life issues with my research. Uh, my dissertation dealt with uh, budget rules and fiscal limits at the state level. And then I had this idea to do a study on the impact of state level pro-life laws. And I noticed the pro-lifers worked hard to pass all these incremental laws. They're trying to pass pro-life parental vomit laws. They're trying to stop state Medicaid programs from funding abortion. And uh, I was kind of wondering, does this have an impact? Are we actually saving lives doing this? So I you know, had a data set. Um, you know, I was able to do some research. And I was very lucky. Uh, the Heritage Foundation agreed to publish my study, uh, I think, the day of the March for Life of 2004. And I... My findings are good. I found that, yes, you know, incremental things do help. If you stop your state Medicaid program from funding abortion, that lowers abortion rates. If your state passes a pro-life parental involvement law, sure, minor girls are less likely to obtain an abortion. So it was a nice study to show that pro-life laws have a positive impact. I thought the pro-life movement would come by, pat me on my head, thank me for the study, tell me what a nice guy I was, and that would be it. It didn't quite work out that way. Uh, the study really you know, caught fire and people wanted me to speak and write and I was getting these invitations and I was happy to accept. And one thing I realized was the pro-life movement really did not have its own kind of in-house social scientist. So uh, that's what I was trained to do. You know, I have a PhD in political science from Stanford. I have a master's degree in statistics. So I just threw over my shoulder and ran with it. So for both academic and popular audiences, I write about things like abortion trends, impact of pro-life laws, contraception programs, public opinion. I am lots of fun at cocktail parties. <laughs> I'm sure you are. And so let's just moving into how Dobbs affected things here. Can you just explain a little bit of what the state was, be- like the state of pro-life work was before um, Dobbs happened? So under Roe, what li- limits were there? Do you know how many abortions were going on? Like what kind of was the pre-Dobbs decision state of America so we can then compare it to where we are now? Sure. Prior to Dobbs, we could do certain incremental things. You know, we could prevent state Medicaid programs from funding abortion. We had the Hyde Amendment, which largely prevented the federal government from funding abortion through Medicaid. We could pass pro-life parental involvement laws uh, that prevented, or at least required minor girls to either notify their parents or obtain permission from their parents for obtaining an abortion. And we could like do informed consent laws, you know, that would give women obtaining abortions information about things like health risks and private and public sources of support and uh, field development. So we could do some incremental things. One thing by and large we could not do though, was pass laws that really protected preborn children after a certain point in gestation. So we could kind of regulate abortion, but we couldn't really protect preborn children. Uh, that said, one thing I always told pro-life audiences before Dobbs, and I still discuss this to this day, we enjoyed a lot of success getting abortion numbers down. You know, between 1980 and about 2017, we cut the abortion rate in half. You know, wow. so we actually made very good incremental progress getting abortion numbers down. And, and that's through the laws that you were just talking about, like the parental involvement and those types of laws? Well, it's been a variety of things. I mean, laws are a big part of it. I mean, there's a good research showing that parental involvement laws, informed consent laws, public funding limits, these things do help. But keep in mind, abortion numbers went down everywhere, even in blue states that really weren't doing much of anything in terms of passing pro-life laws. So one thing I often tell pro-life audiences is, is that we made a lot of progress, not only getting abortion numbers down, and a big reason because of that was because a higher percentage of unintended pregnancies are being carried to term. And we actually get that data from Guttmacher, which is up until 2006 or seven was Planned Parenthood's research arm. And they're not sympathetic to what we're trying to do, but their data makes it clear that, you know, in the 90s, about half of all unintended pregnancies were aborted. That felt like about a third by the late 2010s. So if more unintended pregnancies are being carried to term, that all goes back to things pro-lifers are doing, where they're changing hearts and minds through educational efforts, we're taking better care of pregnant women through uh, pregnancy help centers, or we're passing more and better protective pro-life laws. So we were enjoying, I think, a lot of success getting abortion numbers down. Now, Dobbs obviously you know, changed everything. You know, we, uh, after 49 years of blood, sweat, tears, and a lot of prayer, uh, we got Roe v. Wade overturned. And um, honestly, I was surprised it happened as quickly as it did. I was one of these people who just thought the Supreme Court will 
keep making decisions and allow us to do more incrementally. I didn't necessarily expect Roe to fall in one fell swoop. I didn't either. I mean, that was in shock when that happened. So I was, um, obviously, we were elated. I remember I was uh, at the Supreme Court. I was, uh, almost didn't go that day. Uh, I was not, um, you know, it was not the last decision day. I thought the Dobbs' would be the last day. I almost didn't go, but I knew I had friends there. So I'm like, you know, Michael, you know, why don't you just go there to support your friends? And uh, on the subway, that's when I got the notification that Roe v. Wade finally is overturned. And I joined the celebration of the court. Uh, the folks at Students for Life were nice enough to let me speak at the rally afterwards. You know, I talked to some media members. We kind of celebrated. And then eventually I had to, had to get back to my office and, and do a little bit of work. It's so incredible that you actually got to be there that day. So it was a really you know, exciting, blessed, joyous day. And, you know, lots of good things have happened. Because right now we could actually pass strong laws protecting pre-born children. Mm-hmm. And right now, 14 states have laws in effect, effectively protecting you know, all pre-born children from the moment of conception. Really? Uh, another state, yep, Georgia, uh, has a strong law in place that protects the pre-born after six weeks gestation. That's when a fetal heartbeat can be detected. Uh, Florida and South Carolina passed also passed heartbeat laws. They're being held up in courts right now. You know, we're hoping that litigation will go in our favor and these laws will take effect in the near future. So, uh, you know, there's about 15 states with, you know, strong, solid pro-life laws in place, doing a lot of good. So we're working out for us. Were those laws that have gotten passed since Dobbs happened, or were those like trigger laws that were in place during Roe, and then once Roe was overturned, they went into effect? Do you know? A little bit of both. I mean, there were some more trigger laws, you know, we were the worst state legislators who saw this day coming and didn't want to waste time. And, you know, very lucky that some states did have laws that took effect right after Roe was overturned. Uh, but in some states, um, you know, there had to be, uh, there were no trigger laws. So legislation had to be drafted and debated. And there was a process that they had to go through. But, you know, many state legislatures had their chance to protect preborn children. And we're very lucky they did so. Yeah. Do you know approximately how many children those laws have saved? What's interesting, I mean, getting up-to-date data on abortion is very tough, uh, that the most recent data we have from the CDC is from 2020, which is obviously pre-Dobbs. There's a group called the Society for Family Planning that is trying to get up-to-date data. And what they're doing is they're looking at abortion declines in states that pass pro-life laws and abortion increases elsewhere. You know, laws do a lot of good, but they're not magical. You know, laws can be circumvented. You know, some women will go ahead and obtain abortions in states where the laws are more permissive. Some women will tragically go ahead and try to obtain chemical abortion posts through the mail. But they've kind of tracked again, abortion declines in states that pass pro-life laws and abortion increases elsewhere. And they've roughly found that, you know, the in-state decline has exceeded kind of the out-of-state increases by about 5,000 a month. So here we are as we approach the you know 12-month anniversary, the one-year anniversary of Dobbs. Uh, I think the estimates that Dobbs has probably saved about 60,000 lives already. And I think that's probably a low estimate uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first off, there were some strong pro-life laws in place before Dobbs. The Texas Heartbeat Act actually took effect September of 2021. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but we have some good data from Texas. Uh, I think that was saving at least 1,000 children every month. Oklahoma actually had a law that was in place before Dobbs that I think was, you know, saving some unborn children. So I think that some of the pre-Dobbs laws actually, you know, were doing some good and aren't really fully factored into the, the we count data that this group has. If those, you said Texas and Oklahoma had these laws already before Dobbs. I thought you said that under Roe, we weren't allowed to have that type of protection. Were they, why were those allowed under Roe? Well, basically those laws were in effect partly because they weren't challenged legally. Uh, that essentially they had a very, like the Texas law had a very unique enforcement mechanism. Instead of, you know, in most cases, the government is the enforcement mechanism of most typical laws we have. But there's some circumstances where private actors can go ahead and enforce certain kinds of laws. So this Texas law was written in a unique way that basically gave private citizens the ability to enforce the law. And that made it really resistant to legal challenges. So essentially the law took effect and You know, they need a situation where the law would be challenged and essentially there was not an effective legal challenge in place. So the law was able to take effect. Mm -hmm. We don't know what would have happened, say, had there been a legal challenge and Dobbs had not happened. Mm -hmm. So So the law, you know, just, you know, another law kind of superseded it and preborn children are you know, protected in Texas. So we could do, I mean, that was a unique approach. You know, I appreciate the lawyers being creative and trying to find an interesting way to protect pre-born children. But that's why there were a couple strong laws that did take effect prior to Dobbs. This was a case in Texas, and I think also in Oklahoma. 
Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So probably about 60,000 children have been saved because of Dobbs. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and then you said that was probably a low estimate. Mm -hmm. um, what's it looked like on like the pro-abortion side? Have there been like an increase? I know that a lot of states had were trying to put abortion into their constitution mm -hmm. last fall because Vermont did that, California, and um, Michigan, mm -hmm. I believe all added those. So have we seen an increase since Dobbs in like an attempt to push through like abortion, unrestricted abortion in states? Or do you think that would have happened anyways? Well, I think that essentially there's been a push in certain states to put abortion in the Constitution. Uh, that certainly was the case in Michigan. Michigan had a very old pro-life law uh, that I'm not sure ever really took effect uh, after Dobbs. But supporters of legal abortion in Michigan did put you know constitutional language in their state constitution uh, that essentially guaranteed abortion rights. And pro-lifers you know, fought a good fight there. Uh, but sadly, uh, we didn't get the outcome we wanted. Uh, but basically, there's been a real trend in many states to especially many liberal states, to making abortion laws more permissive. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, for instance, and this was even before Dobbs, uh, for instance, the state Medicaid program in Maine started covering elective abortions. The state Medicaid program in Illinois started covering elective abortions. Uh, Illinois uh, actually repealed their pro-life parental vomit law. Uh, Massachusetts weakened their pro-life parental vomit law. So you said have a Democratic Party that's becoming a lot more liberal, a lot more secular, a lot more hostile to pro-life laws. And a lot of these blue states, uh, they are repealing some of the laws that we passed in many cases, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. But then like the sum total based on like the fact that we now have very pro-life laws in, in pro-life states, it's kind of balancing out to save lives more than it is like, I guess, like, I'm trying to look at a general picture of the scope of the country. Well, the good news outweighs the bad news. I mean, yeah. you know, obviously these, you know, people in blue states still need to, you know, protect the laws they have. Uh, but, you know, certainly protect you know, the pro-life laws. Pro -life laws <laughs> we have. But certainly, I mean, you know, there's some bad news out there. It's not all, you know, uh, you know, good news for pro-lifers. But the good news certainly outweighs the bad. The fact that there's 14 states protecting pre-born children is excellent news and is saving a lot of lives as we speak. Do you think that we're going to see an increase in women traveling over state lines and getting abortion pills in the mail? Or do you think that, that those numbers that we have right now are going to stay the same? You know, I think that obviously, you know, when pro-life laws are passed, you know, the laws can be circumvented. Mm -hmm. You know, some women will cross state lines and sadly get abortions in states where the laws are more permissive. Some women will uh, get abortion pills through the mail, uh, but not all. And one thing I'm very heartened by is that, uh, you know, again, Texas was really the, one of the first states to really have a strong pro-life law in place. I mean, their heartbeat law took effect September of 2021. And I've did a study for the Lozier Institute, and I presented this paper at an academic conference. What I did to really kind of capture the impact of the Texas law was look at births. You know, that uh, you know, when you pass a pro-life law, abortions go down. But some of our critics might say, ah, you know, women are just going out of state or, ah, they're just getting chemical abortion pills with the mail. Well, if more children are being born, that's pretty powerful evidence of laws having an impact. You know, children are hard to miss. They're easy to count. So one thing I noticed is starting around March 2022, birth numbers in Texas went up. Okay. And there's like a record number of children being born in Texas. So and that's about six months after the law. Went yeah, about effect. seven months after effect. So basically, I would say the Texas Heartbeat Act was saving like 1,000 children every month. So you really did see a big birth increase in Texas. And you saw kind of large increases in those Texas counties that were kind of far away from like out-of-state clinics. So essentially, you really did see some evidence that, you know, this law was having a real impact and that saving lives resulting again, more and more children being born. Yeah, that's incredible that we're able to like, I'm glad that we're able to track that data and try to get a feel for what laws are actually doing to save lives. So going forward, what should we do next? Like, what types of laws are the most effective? Mm -hmm. I know that you've mentioned like the heartbeat law. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of different pro-life laws that can be put in place. Which ones do you think are the most effective? I mean, the best you can do is just legally protect preborn children from conception. You know, the best yeah. you can do is that. But I think, you know, you, you know, I'm an incrementalist. You know, I believe sometimes you have to be prudent. You should get the most protective law you can based on the political circumstances. Um, you know, North Carolina passed a protective law. Uh, they protecting preborn children after 12 weeks gestation. Mm -hmm. Would I like a better law? Sure. But it's a start. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the next legislative session, they can get a, a six-week protection or even at conception. Uh, Nebraska, the same thing. So, you know, I'm one of these people who just thinks you have to build incrementally. We should enact the strongest, you know, most protective laws that we can. Some states, based on the politics of who's elected, and, you know, it's not always possible to, you know, completely protect all preborn children. But if we can protect some, you know, we're doing some good. That's yeah. kind of how I've always heard it justified, is it's not that you're saying that children younger than 12 weeks shouldn't be protected. You're just mm -hmm. saying, well, if we have the chance to protect children 12 weeks onward, we need to make sure that we can save their lives if possible. And yep. then slowly move it back mm -hmm. to the best of our ability. Like, Yeah, I mean, the way I see if a house is on fire and there's 100 kids inside the house, I can do something that will save 10 kids, I'll save those 10 kids. 
I want to save them all. I'll run back and try to save the other 90. But if I can save 10 kids today, I'll definitely save those 10 kids. So, uh, like I said, and even, um, you know, there are states that, you know, obviously, you know, where people are a little bit less sympathetic to the pro-life position, you know, the things we've done in the past, whether it's informed consent, parental involvement laws, again, making sure that state Medicaid programs don't pay for abortion. You know, these things all do have a positive impact that, that adds up. And I also just want to say that, you know, laws and legislation are very important. Uh, they do save a lot of lives, but it's not the only thing that we can do. Um, you know, I think that one thing I'm very heartened by is we see a big increase in pregnancy help centers. Yes. Uh, there's close to 3,000. Uh, the numbers uh, since, I guess, the 1980s have like nearly doubled. And we see a lot of states also uh, helping them in different ways, whether it's tax credits or tax write-offs, in some cases, making sure they're eligible for different kinds of government grants. I mean, Texas is the alternative to abortion program, uh, where I think they do allocate millions of dollars every year uh, to these pregnancy centers to help women in need. You know, we need to be there on kind of the service end of things, too. And also just education. You know, our educational efforts are important. You know, I was actually at a street fair in Washington, D.C., uh, one of my friends brought a fuel development model. You know, a lot of the educational things we do uh, on college campuses, in high schools, you know, that's important. You know, I think that we need to fight this on as many ways as we can. I think education, service, legislation, all important. Uh, these are all good activities for pro-lifers to engage in. You mentioned um, in Texas that, um, I just lost my train of thought, let me get it back. Oh, that they have the Alternate to Abortion mm -hmm. Act. Um, is there any way of tracking how effective that is? Or do you just, again, have to look at the births and say, well, there's this law against abortion that's in place and we're trying to alter alternatives and this is the end result? Or is there a way to kind of just track how does funding pregnancy centers work? So maybe for states where they can't necessarily get a law protecting unborn children mm -hmm. in place, they can try to allocate funds for pregnancy centers and know that it's effective. Is there a way to track like that's a, those specific that's a good question. I mean, any time you get government money from the government, you typically you know, need to file reports and let them know how the money is being spent. Uh, you know, I think obviously uh, this program is relatively new, uh, but I think that, you know, certainly we should reach out to pregnancy centers. They can give us data on, you know, how many women they've seen, you know, how many pregnancies are carried to term. You know, some of these places do have maternity homes and they can give us data on the number of women who've stayed there and number of children that were born and, you know, carried to term. So I don't think we have that data just yet at our fingertips, but I think that certainly anything we can do to kind of quantify the good work we do and provide hard, solid data to legislators and policymakers is a, is a worthwhile activity. Mm -hmm. And also just remembering that as pro-lifers, we shouldn't just be trying to put anti-abortion laws in place. We should also mm -hmm. be trying to put laws in place mm -hmm. to help women who are struggling and mm -hmm. encourage them to choose life so that mm -hmm. even if we can't ban abortion, we can still encourage more moms to be able to choose life mm -hmm. and have that funding that they need. Right. We're not, it's not about what we're against. It's also what we're for. You know, yeah. I mean, we need to have a positive vision for motherhood and for parents. And, you know, I think that, you know, we need to think creatively about, you know, what to do both through the government and through the private sector. And you know, a lot of states have stepped up. I mean, like Mississippi expand their Medicaid program to cover pregnant women. And I think cover them even you know, months after the child is born. So you do see some creative thinking on the part of some policymakers. I think we need more of that. You know, my good friends at Americans United for Life have pitched a proposal uh, to make birth free. You know, I think that's a very interesting idea. And I think that should be part of the discussion. Again, I think we want to make society kind of a better place for children, uh, for mothers, for parents. And I think pro-lifers have a lot to offer to that discussion. Yeah, that's definitely true. Are there any countries that we can look at to see how other countries are dealing with the abortion issue that have maybe had successful laws or successful programs in place that we in America can look to for, like, ideas? I mean, I think the... But the you know country that's probably I think of the best policies is Poland, uh, that abortion was legal under communism, and when you know the fall of communism took place, they were very quick to put pro-life laws in place. Uh, they passed one law in 1990. They passed another law in 1993. Uh, abortion numbers fell by about 75 percent in Poland. So you know, the protective laws that Poland has in place, you know, have made a real difference. And again, a higher percentage of unintended pregnancies you know, were carried to term in Poland after these pro-life laws are put in place. And Poland has done certain things to kind of offer just, you know, cash assistance to, you know, mothers and new families. You know, I'm not an expert on the nuances of these policies, but they are, you know, serious about trying to protect the pre-born and put policies in place again, strengthen families and help mothers, parents, and, and children. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good to know. I know it's interesting, like, working here at HLI, hearing mm -hmm. stories about the legal things going on in different countries, because I know... I think it's hungry has a heartbeat bill, mm -hmm. but that isn't that children are protected after the heartbeat. Mm -hmm. It's that mothers have to hear the heartbeat before mm -hmm. getting an abortion. And then that's predicted to save, I think it's about 5,000 children per year. Mm -hmm. So just these different types of like laws mm -hmm. that can be put in place that can try to save children and looking at what's like successful in other places. And then mm -hmm. looking at our own country and trying to figure out the most 
prudent ways to move forward to save the most children. And also, I think we need to lead as well. I mean, one thing that's interesting is talking to international pro-lifers. You know, we've given them some hope. You know, yeah. that obviously in many countries, you know, we have a, I think it's fair to say that we have a larger, more active, more vibrant pro-life movement than maybe some foreign countries do. But a lot of foreign pro-lifers look to us and, wow, if they can do the U.S., heck, maybe we can do it here. So it's exciting to see that there are some real good ripple effects from uh, from Dobbs. What do you think that pro-lifers should focus on going forward? Uh, I just think that it needs to be multifaceted. I mean, I'm not one of these people who thinks there's a, a silver bullet. I just think we need to focus on many things simultaneously. You know, we need to change hearts and minds. You know, educational efforts are important. Taking care of pregnant women is important. Our pregnancy help centers are doing great work. Uh, we need to support them. Uh, and passing more and better protective pro-life laws, you know, is important. That I think, again, education, service, you know, legislation, you know, these are all important. I don't think one's any necessarily important than the other. I think it's multifaceted. You know, I'm not one of these silver bullet pro-lifers who has a, a slogan or idea that's going to change everything. Uh, things don't typically work that way. It's not one thing, it's everything. So it's education, you know, service, legislation, also prayer. I think that's also something we should focus on. Definitely. Yeah, it always seems to me like it's kind of a top down, like you need to work on the grassroots and try to cultivate a culture mm-hmm. that's protecting the family and all that. But then the things that you can do on the government level to mm-hmm. also try to encourage that is you have to go at it in both directions. You can't just expect laws to fix everything mm-hmm. and you, but also having a grassroots movement, but like anti-life laws are going to create a problem as well. So you kind of need to work on both fronts. And I think father bouquet uses the example of whittling, like you have mm-hmm. to whittle down and try to whittle those laws down to save more lives. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting situation moving mm-hmm. forward and kind of being able to look back on Dobbs a year ago and look forward to the future. But I'm glad that, the sum total seems to be that Dobbs is saving lives. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Much appreciated. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. And to our listeners, please like, follow, subscribe. Um, keep on living the culture of life. God bless.